Hi, I'm Lee Stranahan, and welcome to Video Toaster Users, Things You Can't Do with a Video Toaster and How to Do Them. In this tape, we're going to be giving you a number of tips and tricks to cover the entire toaster, from the switcher and character generator to toaster paint and even LightWave 3D. Now, we've got a lot of material to cover in this tape and not a lot of time to do it, so we've moved pretty quickly, in fact, quicker than we usually do on the tapes I've produced. So what we want you to do is have this tape right by your toaster so you can sit down and follow along. So pull up your toaster and let's get right into it. Kiki? Okay, gratuitous use of effects, but it beats walking. Now the first thing we want to talk about in this tape is some things you can do with your CG. Everyone knows that you can key text over video using the toaster's character generator. But that gets a little boring because when you key the text using the toaster, it just fades up and fades off. And we want to put text over the video, but we want to do something a little more interesting with it. So we're going to use the toaster's luminance keyer that's built in. Let's start, though, by creating the CG page. And to do that, of course, we will go into CG. OK, let's just type in our title here. And let's pick everything on the screen. And just add a slightly bigger font. And once this renders it up, let's just center this whole thing on the uh, page. Center it horizontally and vertically. There we go. OK. Now, if we just use this normally, this is a key page. So it's going to key up over the video. But again, it's only going to fade up or fade off. We're going to use the luminance gear, which means our background color for this has to be black. Because what we're going to do is we're going to create this page with a black background. Then we're going to get rid of the black elements in the picture. So to do that, we don't use a key page. We're going to go and use the color page. And we're going to go to the color selector. And let's just change our background color to one color, black. All right, so far so good. Now let's just render this up and see how it's going to look. OK, we rendered the graphic, and it's in DV1 in the preview bus. Let's select our footage on main. That's an in input 2 on this system. And now DV1 selected on preview. Let's select DV1 on the superimposed bus. And one thing you'll notice is that we can't select it. It's because whenever you leave the CG, again, it's something you can't do. You can't select the keyer after you leave the CG. What we have to do is we have to click on any effect. The screen flashes, and now we can pick DV1. And we want to get rid of the black elements, so we'll choose black as our key color. And now it's just a matter of setting a level. And you'll see as I hold down the left mouse button and move the mouse up and down, it changes the level of what's being keyed out. If the number is too low, we get just the graphic and nothing else. If it's too high, the graphic vanishes. OK, so far, so good. That's working. And now with this up here, we can use our toaster effects, particularly the digital effects, to fly this around. And again, it's a pretty easy, straightforward process. We just pick any effect. I will go here to the F bank. This effect will fly video off. So I select it, click Auto. And let's take a look at the way that looks. If we want to fly that back in, we'll just pick an effect that flies video in, like this one. And again, run the Auto transition. That flies it there. One problem here is the toaster's keyer has made the text look pretty anemic. You'll notice that the text doesn't look nearly as good as it normally would, and that the keyer puts up this sort of garbage over on the left-hand side of the screen. So the toaster cannot really do a clean key using CG graphics. Two, three. Or can it? Maybe it can. Let's go back into the CG and change this text so it will look good. Now what we're going to do is let's just select all the text again, and let's go to the color requester. And the color for our text is white. That's fine. We'll leave that where it is. But take a look at our shadow and border colors. You'll notice that on the RGB sliders, these are all at 0, 0, 0. This won't work. The reason this isn't going to work is because since the shadow and border colors are at 0, when we key out the black, which is also at 0, it's keying out the shadow and border. So it's going to look bad. 
So what we need to do is we need to raise shadow and border colors up a little bit higher. And that's pretty straightforward. We'll raise the shadow to 35 on all three sliders. And if you're wondering why we're using 35 here, it's because it works. 35 is the setting you want to use. Also, the alpha channel transparency that you have in Toaster 4000 and 3.0, we're going to turn off. We're going to make it fully opaque. And let's do the same thing for our border here. We'll just set this to 35 and make it fully opaque and continue. Okay, the problem is that we have this garbage, which is internal delay, over to the right-hand side. So what we need to do is we need to mask this some way. And what we can do, it's pretty simple. With this set to 35, it's now going to raise the level of the shadow and outline to match this stuff that's over on the right. And if we put a shadow straight down, it's going to combine with the fake shadow, the black stuff, over to the right to make a shadow that looks like it goes straight down and over to the right. So again, pretty straightforward here. We just take our shadow and put it straight down. That's all there is to it. And now let's render this up. Of course, when we exit out again, we try to select that. It's in DV1. We try to select it on the keyer. Can't click on any effect. There we go. And it's just a matter of adjusting our clip level. And again, you'll notice the text looks a lot better now. It's got the shadow and outline on it. And again, we can do all the fun stuff we were doing moving it around with digital effects. All right now, we're going to use the same technique and build on it. What we're going to do is we're going to create a very common CG effect. That's where you see one keyed title, for instance, produced by, then it just cuts to another keyed title, but the background video stays the same. The problem with doing that in the toaster is that every time you want to go from one title to another, it's key up, so it fades up the keyed graphic, fade down, then fade up the other one, fade up, fade down. It gets very boring. So again, you can't do that sort of cut with the toaster. But maybe you can. So here's all we're going to do. Let's head back to this character generator. And let's just copy this page to page 1. So now we have identical pages. Here's page 0, here's page 1. The reason we did a copy here is so it would remember all of our color settings. Now we'll just type in our next graphic. And once again, center this. And you'll notice that it's kept all of our color and shadow settings exactly the same because we did that copy. All right, now exit the CG. And we will load up the first graphic. And as soon as this loads up, I'll take a look at the buffer it went into. That's in DV1. I'm just going to do a take to bring this up to main. And now we'll load in the second graphic. And because DV1 is in the main output, DV2 is going to have to be where the next graphic loads into. It can't load into DV1 because that's showing on your main or program output. So again, now we have two graphics, one on DV1, one on DV2. Again, you can see as I'm just switching between them. Now, what do we do? Put up our footage, key it up, can't select the keyer, click on an effect, select DV1. You want to do a cut? Just click on TV2. Pretty darn simple. So again, this is a pretty good way to get that sort of effect without having to go through the whole fade up, fade off routine. Now, there's one other thing that's nice is since you can use the digital effects with this, you've got a whole bunch of digital effects that'll work. The problem is the toaster's digital effects only work in one direction. Well, again, maybe they don't. So for instance, if we were to pick this effect, this is an effect that brings video off screen. So every time we run it, it brings video off screen. Well, let's just manually run this effect, grabbing the T-bar with the left mouse button, if I drag the T-bar up and down, you can see how we're just moving to various points during the transition. Well, if we bring it about part way through the transition, I've got about halfway. We've got a few options here. Here's two of them. I've got the effect partially run. If I hit the space bar, what that's going to do is continue the effect forward. See how the T-bar goes up. Then at the bottom of its position, it just shoots back to the top and switches our inputs, completes the effect. Or, let's manually run it again, hold down the shift key, hit the space bar, 
And watch what the T-bar does here. Notice how it moves up and our effect runs backwards. So again, just holding down the shift key and hitting the space bar runs an effect backwards. So here's how we can use this. We can take this transition and have it run the opposite way, basically. All right, so let's run the effect down. And you'll notice at the top, very top, and very bottom positions, there's no little orange triangle there. But it's anywhere in the middle, that orange triangle is lit up. And that tells us the effect is partially completed. If I bring it all the way to the bottom, see how it goes away? If I release the mouse button, you notice it shoots right back up to the top. But if I bring it almost all the way to the bottom, so the orange triangle's still lit, release that, now it stays right where it is. And if we look up at our main screen, our program monitor, you'll see that we cannot see the title. It's still there. Now, hold down shift, hit the space bar, and flies right back in. So again, there's a way to run effects backwards. And a lot of the effects in the toaster will run backwards. You might want to experiment to find out which ones will work. A lot of the digital effects in 2.0 and a bunch of the wipes, actually, in uh, the new version, Toaster 4000 and 3.0, will work for you as well. OK, now let's do a little bit of work in the 3D program, Lightwave. And we're actually going to be doing some toaster paint stuff here as well. Now, the effect that we want to create is the effect of a moving sheen, of sort of lights moving across metallic letters. It's a common logo look. You see it all the time. The problem is you can't really do it in Lightwave because the lights in Lightwave, the actual spotlights, are round. So you don't get this sort of diagonal moving sheen. You get these nice round lights. Well, we don't want that. We want a moving sheen. Again, can't do it using the lights in Lightwave. But there's another way. So here's what we'll do. Let's take a look at how that logo will look first. And here's an example of the kind of look we're talking about. Again, you can see the diagonal ones. This is just a 60 frame, a two second moving sheen animation. I got it moving pretty quick here. But this is just playing right off the Toaster 4000 using the animation playback modes. And again, you'll notice how the light moving across it's diagonal and it gets a pretty realistic effect. So how do we do that? Well, the trick is we don't use lights. We're going to use the toaster's reflection mapping surface attributes. So let's get into Lightwave and set this scene up. Let's load up our logo object first. Again, this is just a simple PostScript object that was created in the Toaster 4000's modeler. And the key thing here is getting the right surface attributes. Now we're going to be using reflection mapping. And the way reflection mapping works is that you load in an image then you tell the object to reflect that image. In other words, the object is going to act like a mirror, but for that image. And one question that comes up is, where is the image? And the image actually isn't anywhere in the scene. In other words, the image isn't a physical object that you could bring the camera up to and point at. The image is this sphere that goes around the entire 3D universe. And any objects that have that image selected will reflect that image. But you're not actually going to see the image anywhere except as a reflection. So first thing is we need to load up an image. And we're going to make our own image by using toaster paint. So let's just exit out of here. We can see there's our logo. And let's just exit back to toaster paint for a moment and make an image pretty quickly here. And we're going to go to full screen mode. And you'll notice this roll of tool panels We'll, when we go to full screen mode, we'll shrink down considerably. We're going to want to use the filled vector tool, which is the vector tool, filled option. And what this lets you do is create diagonal things. Every time I click the left mouse button, it's like I'm putting a thumbtack here. And then as soon as I hit the right mouse button, right here, as soon as I hit that, it's going to complete the shape. Now, very, very useful tool for this, because we're going to be drawing diagonal lines. But the problem is, as soon as I go to the full screen mode, it goes away. You can't use it. You won't see it there anymore. There's no tool there anymore. So can't use that tool in full screen mode. Or can you? Well, of course, this being the tape shows you how to do stuff you can't do. Of course, you can use it. The way you do that is you use the keyboard equivalent, which is Shift-V. V for vector, Shift for filled. If I hit Shift-V, now I can draw with that same tool in the full screen mode here. So you see how that'll work. This is not the image we want, though. So let's just quickly clear out our screen. Hold down the right mouse button and select Clear from Picture. Uh, let's clear it to black. 
and we're just going to go to range mode here and draw a color range. On this side, I'm going to select white. You'll see white appears that we're in range mode. On this side, I will pick black. And what this is going to do is it's going to draw a range of colors going from black on one side to white in the middle. And then it's just a matter of drawing these big sort of diagonal thingies. So let's start up here in the corner. Click, click, right mouse button. So here's one. And these are actually going to be what's reflected. Now the way the reflection mapping will work is the darker parts will be dark. That kind of makes sense. The lighter parts will be the sheen. And again, by drawing these sort of diagonal shafts of light, this is going to look, as you'll see, pretty darn good. So let's draw this right down here. And again, I have these in varying sizes. In the animation you saw earlier, I had a number of varying sizes, some smaller, some thicker. Okay, there we go. This is the image. And now let's just go save RGB. And this will save it into the images directory that Lightwave looks for things in. So we'll just call this moving sheen. And our work is done in toaster paint. So let's quit out. OK, let's head back into 3D and just load up the image. And there it is, moving sheen. And you'll notice Toaster 4000, of course, shows us a little version. There's our image. And now when we go to surfaces, we're going to set the surface for this logo object. It's pretty easy because it's the only surface in here. So it just got the default name. Let's just rename this logo object. Now what we're going to do is we're going to turn our diffuse down to zero. With no diffuse and no specular, the object will take on no color except whatever is being reflected. So let's turn reflectivity up to 100%. That means that the object will be acting essentially as a mirror. And we will select as reflected image, moving sheen. Now the only other thing I want to do here is maybe change our surface color a little bit. Maybe give it a little bit of a light blue tint. Click OK. Click on color highlights. And this should get us a pretty good surface. To test this, I'm just going to change my camera to low resolution and hit F9 to do a quick render here. So I just want to get a real quick idea of how this is going to look. And so far, looks completely dark. Can't see anything. Probably one of the reasons we can't see anything is right now, there's a pretty good bet that the object is between two of those reflection diagonal doohickeys that we just drew in toaster paint. Not to get too technical there with the term doohickey, but it's right between two of the sheens, so it's completely dark. Now, there's two ways we can change that. One of them is by raising the diffuse level a little bit. This way the object will have some of the color itself right there. And I'm going to do that first. Let's just raise our diffuse level to around, oh, 10%. And again, hit F9 to render. This will give us a little something there. And you can see that on the program monitor. It's dark, but you can definitely see some sort of color there. That's one option. The other one is this. In surfaces on Toaster 4000, you see that there's an image seam angle. And what this has to do is, again, if the image is wrapped around a sphere, is which part of the sphere are you looking at? When you change the image sphere angle, it's almost like you're rotating the sphere. And if we were to rotate this, say, 15 or 20 degrees, we'd probably show up on one of those reflective doohickeys that we drew in toaster paint. Now, the way that we get those sheens moving is that if we were to rotate the object, and think about this, if we were to rotate the object, it would look as though, since, it's ro since the object's rotating, where it's facing in this reflective sphere would change. And as the object rotates, the reflections would change. And so you get these diagonal things moving right across the logo. Now, the problem is, is that we don't want the logo spinning. We want the logo to look like it's being held in place. So 
what we're going to do is we're going to rotate the logo, but we're going to fake it so it looks like the logo isn't moving at all. And we're going to do that by attaching the camera to the logo. And that's pretty straightforward, pretty easy to do. We'll go to camera, we'll select parent, and we want to parent the camera to the logo object. This means wherever we rotate the logo, the camera will follow. And you can see that from camera mode. You notice the logo doesn't look like it's moving at all. We rotate ourselves up here a little bit. You'll see though, the background is moving. It's not really the background that's moving. Let's just go to a top view and back off a little bit. Here's our camera. Here's our logo. And when the logo rotates, the camera's moving right along with it. So the way we get these sheens moving across the letters is just to have the logo do a complete 360 degree rotation. We have three sheens that we created. Therefore, we're going to get three sheens moving across the letters over the 360 degree rotation. And again, that's pretty easy to do. Select our object. We'll just reset it back to its normal position. Create a keyframe at zero. Now let's go to frame 60 and rotate it 360 degrees. That's one full rotation. And create a keyframe here to hold that in place. Now, the way this is going to look if we make a preview, let's make a 60 frame preview here. So the logo is going to do a complete rotation. And again, the camera's moving right along with it. And since Lightwave renders everything from the camera's perspective, the logo is going to look like it's holding perfectly still, and you're going to get these sheens moving across it. And let's take a look at the way this animation, the one we just created right here, looks when you actually render it out. So there you have it. Again, it's a pretty good look here, and not that difficult. Let's just do one other thing, though, before we leave here. We've shown you the rendered animation. This is one other important thing to remember. If you want the object to keep the same surface attributes, you have to resave the object. So to do that, we just go to the Objects panel, Save Object, and we'll keep the same name, Logo. And yep, we'll overwrite it. This way, the next time you load up the Logo object, it'll have exactly the same surface attributes. OK, that's all the time we have for this tape. We hope you enjoyed it. And again, you can get a lot of this kind of information and much, much more from reading Video Toaster User. Also, I do have a series of training tapes, the Desktop Images series, that have just a ton of this stuff takes you step by step through everything. Also, we're going to be coming to a town somewhere near you on a massive training tour that I'm embarking on, and I'm probably on the road as we speak right now. Again, you can find information about desktop images or our training tour in Video Toaster User. We hope you enjoyed this tape, got some good stuff out of it. Keep working. And until next time, I'm Lee Stranahan. Thanks a lot.